Hello and welcome. I'm Ross King and this is Renaissance Discoveries. And in this video, we're going to look at the Italian discovery of the garden in the 1400s. I suspect most of us have an idea in our head of what an Italian garden looks like. The graveled paths, the geometric patterns of well-clipped boxwood hedges, the marble statues, the terracotta pots, the ponds, maybe the fountains, all very symmetrical, patterned, formal, rational, and ordered, like a kind of plant-based classical architecture, and of course, all very beautiful and desirable. These distinctive gardens gradually spread outward from Italy to England, France, and Spain, to America, and even recently to Shanghai, where we see this wonderful example. By the 20th century, this style of gardening came to be celebrated in Italy as the national style, one that originated in Florence in the 1400s, but as we'll see, took inspiration from ancient Rome. It seems natural to us that the Florentines would have created this hugely influential style. After all, as we see in other of my videos, the Florentines reconfigured visual space and the built environment, often by looking over their shoulders at what the ancients had done, and their innovations in art and architecture then took the world by storm. The Italian Renaissance, especially the Florentine Renaissance, was characterized by rediscovery of the writings, statues, and buildings of the ancient Romans and a reinterpretation of visual space through things such as linear perspective. These developments were crucial to the flowering of architecture and painting, but they likewise had a dramatic impact on both the design and function of the garden in the 15th century. We're used to thinking of the Italian Renaissance as the rebirth of arts and learning in architecture with Filippo Brunelleschi, in painting with Masaccio and Leonardo da Vinci, in sculpture with Donatello and Michelangelo, and in philosophy with Marsilio Ficino and Pico della Mirandola, a pair I talked about in some of my other videos. But gardening was also reborn or rediscovered at this same time and from similar sources and with similar motivations and effects. And so the garden too was one of the things explored and reinvented by the men who created what we call the Renaissance. I want to begin the story with this guy. Many of you might recognize him from another of my videos. This is Francesco Petrarca, AKA Petrarch, poet, scholar, traveler, manuscript hunter, and all around vitally important historical figure. We can't understand and appreciate Western culture and civilization without him. He's crucial in so many ways to so many things, and one of those things was gardening. Petrarch was a passionate, hands-on gardener. He created gardens wherever he lived in the south of France and northern Italy. One of the various places where he made a garden, or rather gardens plural, was Vaucluse near Avignon in the south of France. I've made two gardens that please me wonderfully, he wrote. I do not think they are to be equaled in all the world. He wrote that one of these gardens was shady among the rocks and overlooking the river and designed for contemplation. It is a place, he wrote, where even an inert mind may rise to lofty thoughts. His other garden at Vaucluse was closer to his house. I am confident, he said, that it much resembles the place where Cicero went to declaim. Cicero was Petrarch's hero, we'll come to him in a minute. This spot was also good for philosophizing. It invites study, he wrote. Here I retreat during the noontide hours. So these are gardens where Petrarch studies and thinks. They're not designed to produce food, they're for something else entirely. They're food for thought, we might say. They're intellectual or philosophical gardens in which mind and spirit are cultivated. They represent a retreat from the city or town into nature and into a contemplative leisure in order to reach a higher level of intellectual and spiritual existence. 
Petrarch also designed gardens in Parma in the late 1340s, and then a decade later in Arqua, now rechristened Arqua Petrarca in his honor. In these gardens, he was concerned with plants. He conducted a series of horticultural experiments, the results of which he carefully jotted down in the fly leaves of a copy of one of his books, which we see here. It's now in the Vatican Library. Petra wasn't just trying out various plants and flowers. He was trying out the ancients. He was testing classical theories of gardening and horticulture to see if they would work in the real world of the present. And this was typical of Petrarch, for whom the ancients offered a kind of playbook for how to proceed in the modern life of the 14th century. He cast his gaze longingly backwards from the present, from the 1300s, to the classical past. He's the one who coined and popularized the term the Dark Ages. He was self-consciously aligning himself with the ancients rather than his contemporaries. In gardening, as in so many other things for Petrarch, the ancients were the inspiration, the ones who might know how to do things better than his benighted contemporaries. Now, there were, of course, gardens in the so-called Dark Ages, especially in monasteries. Back in the 6th century AD, St. Benedict planted a garden in his monastery at Subiaco, near Rome, because he wanted his monks to be self-sufficient in herbs, food, and medicine. But these monastery gardens were very utilitarian, planted for practical reasons, not for pleasure. People in the Middle Ages did appreciate beauty and pleasure, including in gardens. The German Dominican Albertus Magnus, or Albert the Great, who became a bishop and later a saint, wrote a treatise on gardens in which he described places of no great utility or fruitfulness that are designed for pleasure, and he wrote approvingly of them. And in fact, the pleasure garden was a feature of aristocratic life in England and France throughout the Middle Ages. It's too easy and simple to look at the people of the Middle Ages, as we all too often do, as puritanical killjoys. And in fact, Umberto Eco has an entire book called Art and Beauty in the Middle Ages, showing that there was plenty of both. But the garden was an ambiguous realm in the Christian tradition, not least because it had been in a garden, in the Garden of Eden, of course, where the serpent tempted Adam and Eve. Gardens were seen as places of worldliness and danger. In medieval Christianity, there was an inherent danger in beauty. Saint Anselm of Canterbury believed that objects and experiences were spiritually dangerous in proportion to the number of physical senses that they delighted. He wrote that the delight of the senses is rarely good and mostly bad. And gardens, he said, delighted the senses of both sight and smell, as well as the ears if someone was on hand to sing songs or tell stories. St. Anselm might have been an extreme example, but you only have to read Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales to see these sorts of associations. This image is from an 18th century illustration of the extramarital shenanigans described in the garden in The Merchant's Tale. Gardens were often represented in art and literature as places of amorous trysts that embodied the carnal desires that we must renounce in order to find God, because Christian redemption meant a liberation from sensual earthly existence. The link between sexual liberation and the garden is made most emphatically in Hieronymus Bosch's The Garden of Earthly Delights, now in the Prado in Madrid, where we see various shenanigans that would make even Geoffrey Chaucer blush. We might want to say that in the Middle Ages, the garden was female, or at least a female space, because of its association with Eve, or more positively with the Virgin Mary, who was often represented in an enclosed garden. Gardens were also associated with the unabashed feminine eroticism of the Song of Songs, in which the woman entices her lover into a garden. Let my beloved come into his garden, she says, and taste its choice fruits. To which the lover replies, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I've gathered my myrrh and my spice. 
I've eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. But the garden will become, for the Florentines of the 1400s, a more masculine and intellectual space. As we've seen, Petrarch began consciously emulating Cicero's garden at Arpinum, as described in the laws written in the 40s BC. Cicero's garden had water features, a fish pond, a garden with shady trees and seats, and a nymphaeum, or a grotto dedicated to a water nymph. All of this might sound like a medieval garden of love, or even Bosch's garden of earthly delights, but Cicero would retire here not to be seduced by young ladies, but to think and to discuss philosophy with his friends. For the Greeks and Romans, the garden had been this masculine space for philosophizing. Greek philosophy had taken place out of doors in the natural environment. Plato taught his students, all male of course, in a sacred grove of olive trees known as the Academy. He supposedly taught beneath this tree, which survived intact and alive until recently when it was hit by a bus. Aristotle, meanwhile, taught while walking through the colonnaded walkways or peripatoi of the Lyceum, for which reason the school of philosophy came to be known as peripatetic. All of this alfresco philosophizing resonated loudly with Petrarch and the scholars who came after him. They took much inspiration from the double meaning of the Latin word cultus, which is the root of both cultivation, as in plants, and worship or veneration, as in cult. And we speak today, for example, of a cultivated person. So we have developing this idea of the garden of the intellect. In the middle of the 1400s, this idea of the garden as a place for contemplation and self-improvement for masculine intellectual industry was expressed by Cosimo de' Medici. He wrote that in a garden, you cultivated your soul as well as the plants. In 1462, he wrote a letter to the philosopher Marsilio Ficino. Yesterday, I came to the Villa Careggi. I'll come to it in a minute. I came to the Villa Careggi, he said, not to cultivate my fields, but my soul. Bring with you Plato's book. So the pair of them are going to study Plato in this rural retreat. Cosimo was a crucial figure in Florence, the wealthiest man in Europe who happened to be an intelligent and cultivated individual with an interest in the arts, philosophy, and culture. He was interested, like Petrarch a hundred years earlier, in unearthing the treasures and ideas of the ancients. He therefore sponsored the recovery of ancient Greek and Roman manuscripts, something I talk about elsewhere, for example, in my videos on Plato and Quintilian. In other videos, too, I talk about how the Florentines of the 1400s looked back to the ancients for inspiration. For example, through the newly rediscovered works of the ancients, they found out that the Romans had founded public libraries, and they then took their cues from this, founding libraries of their own, thanks in large part, in that case, to donations from, guess who, Cosimo de' Medici. It was the same with gardens. The Florentines began reading ancient manuscripts that described the aesthetic and intellectual pleasures of gardens. Cicero, Pliny the Younger, the poet Martial, all described their own personal gardens, while two other Roman writers, Vitruvius and Pliny the Elder, gave advice about what and how to plant. Florentines could also read about the lavish gardens of the Roman emperors. The historian Suetonius described the gardens of Nero and Caligula. He described, for example, how Caligula had gardens planted on his galleys so he could enjoy greenery and fresh oranges as he was rowed up and down the coast, something that's recently come back into vogue with the trend for gardens on super yachts. But what really interested the Florentines of the 1400s were the more intimate gardens, such as those that Cicero and Pliny the Younger laid out in their country estates gardens that were about contemplation and relaxation rather than, as in the case of the emperors, shock and awe. 
like Petrarch, certain Italian scholars and landowners of the 1400s began self-consciously emulating the gardens of the ancients, especially at their suburban or country retreats. And many well-heeled Florentines had country retreats. In about 1410, a silk merchant named Goro Dati wrote, Outside the city walls are beautiful dwellings of citizens with decorated gardens of wonderful beauty. And the countryside is so full of palaces and noble dwellings that it seems to be a city. This is a painting done about 50 years later in 1460 for the Medici family by Benozzo Gozzoli, and it shows what the landscape around Florence would have looked like in those days, dotted with these suburban villas. Some of the country properties in the hinterland outside Florence belonged to the Medici, who were instrumental in the development of the Italian garden. Cosimo is the one who began building up the Medici property portfolio with his wealth from the banking industry. The family owned a number of castles in their stronghold in the Mugello Valley to the north of Florence, such as this one, the Castello del Trebbio, which Cosimo inherited in 1428 when his father died. Cosimo gave it a makeover, hiring the Florentine architect Michelozzo Michelozzi to make it a suitably commodious country residence. In 1440, Cosimo also bought another nearby castle, Cafagelo, which he likewise hired Michelozzo to remodel. However, both of these buildings were very much medieval fortresses with watchtowers, machicolation, moats, and drawbridges, and all the available documentation seems to suggest that, although they did have gardens, these were not pleasure gardens, but rather kitchen gardens intended to provide food for the table. It's tempting to be deceived by much later representations of these buildings, ones done in 1599 by the Flemish painter Justus van Utens, who painted the Medici collection of properties on orders of Grand Duke Ferdinand, almost as a kind of inventory, because there were 14 Medici villas at that point, and perhaps Ferdinand wanted to be able to keep them all straight in his head. At that point, in the late 1500s, Trebio and Cafagelo did have ornamental gardens, but all the evidence suggests that they did not have these gardens under Cosimo in the 1400s. The same probably goes for Cosimo's most famous retreat, the Villa di Careggi, just outside Florence. This was an old manor house bought by Cosimo's father in 1417 and inherited by Cosimo from his brother in 1457, and then once again given the Michelozzo makeover. However, Careggi still retained a kind of military aspect, perhaps deliberately as a show of power or as an attempt to manufacture or suggest a noble past for the Medici, were not actually of especially ancient or distinguished pedigree. Careggi is often seen as the prototype of the Italian garden, but evidence for this role is actually extremely slight. There was a garden at Careggi, but it too seems to have been little more than a kitchen garden. Certainly Cosimo took a great interest in horticulture and agriculture, it was here at Careggi, for example, that he used to go out each morning to tend his grapevines with his own hands, but his concern with land was really commercial rather than contemplative. Instead, another Medici villa and another member of the Medici family seems to have provided the prototype for so many gardens that followed. <music> This is the Villa Medici at Fiesole, a country villa built just north of Florence in the 1450s for the younger of Cosimo's two legitimate sons, Giovanni, who was then in his 30s. Giovanni de' Medici is an interesting character. He's someone who is expected to head into commerce and help run the Medici businesses, but his true love was art and literature. He was a rich kid, but he was a very smart rich kid who wanted to spend his wealth on beautiful things. He'd been extremely well-educated and was a keen student of Latin. He loved ancient Roman poetry, for example. And he built up an impressive library of classical literature 
thanks to help from the bookseller of Florence, Vespasiano da Bisticci, the man on whom there is, I believe, an excellent recent volume. Giovanni was also an art collector. He bought ancient Roman statues and coins, he commissioned tapestries and sculptures, and he even had the great Donatello design a desk for him. He was, I suspect, the life of every party. He loved to eat and drink, and he loved the company of poets, scholars, and musicians. Giovanni intended his new house in Fiesole to be a kind of refined palace of pleasure. It was not a place with an emphasis on agriculture, but rather the focus was on cultural refinement. It was in this house that Giovanni would keep his books, his musical instruments, and artwork such as a pair of Madonnas that Donatello also created for him. And of course, the house would have a garden. The garden was completed in about 1457, or rather the gardens plural were completed because there were two of them on two different levels. Giovanni had the steep hillside terrace with the help of skilled engineers from Florence. This is one of the very first post-classical applications of engineering technology to garden design. The art historian Amanda Lilly has pointed out that Giovanni's commission challenged norms concerning the location and design of a country house, and that its dramatic sight cut into the side of a steep hill and requiring massive retaining walls was unprecedented. So it's clear that Giovanni intended to do something different here. On the lower terrace, there was a kitchen garden for growing vegetables and herbs, while on the upper one beside the house, there was an ornamental garden. Records show that Giovanni imported orange trees, lemon trees, and pomegranate trees from Naples. He also had the area planted with cypresses and other trees. These trees were then planted as what the documents call a boschetto, or what's known in Fran French as a bosque, that is, a planting of trees in a regular pattern, such as a row or a column. The terrace also included what a document called a formal walled garden divided into flower beds. Unfortunately, the document doesn't tell us what flowers, but we know from other records that Giovanni grew roses and carnations. A friend, for example, once wrote to him asking him to send him cuttings of his red and white roses, as well as his carnations. Giovanni also, no doubt, had statues in his ornamental garden. In one letter, he writes about wanting to get some ancient Roman portrait busts of emperors to put into the garden's walls. The garden had a special relationship with its surroundings. The villa opened onto this garden as if the garden were a kind of extension of the house itself, another elegant room or series of rooms to be enjoyed by Giovanni and his guests, both visually from inside the house and, of course, physically within the confines of the garden itself. But the garden's confines were in some ways unlimited because the garden also extended into the countryside beyond as a kind of infinity garden. It was not walled off from the countryside, but gave a kind of visual access to it. Giovanni deliberately chose this site in order to enable this visual effect. As a writer noted a few decades later, the hills of Fiesole, particularly the part looking towards the Arno and Florence, were the loveliest, the most pleasant, and the most delightful that nature, together with art, could ever make. So this garden is very different from anything done by Giovanni's father Cosimo. In this design, Giovanni was almost certainly inspired by the writings of the ancients whose works he collected and loved. And so, just as architects such as Filippo Brunelleschi were riffing on ancient Roman themes in their architecture, Giovanni, and whoever helped him with the plan, I'll come to him in a minute, was referencing the ancient Roman passion for beauty and order in his garden. In fact, Giovanni's house almost looks like an attempt to recreate the Tuscan villa of Pliny the Younger. For example, when Pliny describes his estate in Tuscany, he boasts that it's on the side of a hill with a panoramic view of the plain, and that it features 
a terrace laid out in beds of various shapes. Now, Giovanni may have had a specialist helper on staff as he planned his garden, namely the architect and writer Leon Battista Alberti. Giovanni began building his villa and laying out the garden around the same time that Alberti, who was a kind of acolyte or follower of Brunelleschi, completed his book on architecture, on the art of building, which became a Bible of Renaissance architecture. Alberti's name has long been linked with the Villa Medici. Much of the work on the site seems to have been done by one of his protégés, Bernardo Rossellino, but it's probably not stretching things to see Alberti involved with Giovanni de' Medici in the design of both villa and garden. Alberti's treatise described, among many other types of buildings, the country villa of the gentleman. In other words, exactly the kind of house that Giovanni built. Alberti said that this kind of rural retreat should be built in a place that had a view of either the sea or plains and mountains. And this is the view from Giovanni's house, and it takes some beating. We can see the landscape in the foreground and Florence shimmering in the distance. Let him have the delights of gardens, Alberti wrote, and he then gave lots of advice about what these gardens should look like. Alberti's prescription for gardens, like those for his buildings, frequently referenced the ancients, showing that he was doing his homework in the classics. And in fact, Alberti was one of the very first readers in the Vatican Library in Rome around this time. He was doing some work for Pope Nicholas V and took advantage of the Pope's large manuscript collection that came to form the nucleus of the Vatican Library. And therefore, Alberti's approach to gardening owed a lot to the writings of the ancients, people such as Theophrastus, whom he cites numerous times in his book. Alberti described what kinds of trees and shrubs to plant, things such as cypress, ivy, box, laurel, myrtle, and juniper, and also how to plant them, that is, as shady walkways and in geometrical patterns, or what he calls circles, semicircles, and the like, or else in rows exactly even, answering to one another exactly upon straight lines. So Alberti advocates, and this is what is epoch making, he advocates the subdivision of spaces into geometrical patterns. Alberti had a sense of beauty as what he called following Cicero, conchinitas, an exact and finely balanced order or arrangement of parts. For Alberti and other architects such as Brunelleschi, order and rationality were best expressed in geometrical form. So Alberti's ideal garden is, like his architecture, governed by rational order and a precise sense of measure, all with a strong classical accent. And here are a couple of his buildings. Let's feast our eyes on the Tempio Malatestiano in Rimini, which Alberti did for Sigismondo Malatesta, and the Church of Sant'Andrea in Mantua, done for Lodovico Gonzaga. This seems to be what the Florentines brought to garden design. They took what they knew of ancient Roman architecture, its vocabulary of semicircles and symmetry, and applied it to gardens. So the Florentines were first of all inspired by the ancient Romans to create ornamental gardens for beauty and contemplation, but they didn't really know what their layout was because none of these ancient gardens still existed in any sort of recognizable form. They therefore began imposing on the garden the same kind of symmetry and balance inspired by the ancient Romans that they had begun using in their architecture. It made sense, after all, to have the garden complement or echo the design of the villa itself. So one of the knock-on effects of the Florentine reinvention of the architectural vocabulary was a reinvention of the layout of the garden. Sadly, Giovanni didn't enjoy his house for too long. He died in 1463 at the age of 42, perhaps due to his partying and immoderate consumption of food and wine. But he is the one that we can thank, along with Alberti, for pioneering the Italian garden, 
for placing the emphasis not on utility, but on grace, beauty, and measure, on carefully designed visual effects intended to please the eye and elevate the mind. The villa and garden at Fiesole became famous enough that both appeared in a number of paintings, such as this one by Domenico Ghirlandaio in Santa Maria Novella in Florence. And it became something of an elite tourist spot, with one visitor from Venice in 1475 noting that, by all means, one must see the place at Fiesole. The house and garden at Fiesole would come to serve the purpose envisaged by Giovanni, because decades after his death, it became a meeting place for Florence's greatest intellectuals. The villa was ultimately inherited by Giovanni's nephew Lorenzo, aka Lorenzo the Magnificent, and he would turn it into the kind of intellectual retreat frequented by scholars and writers such as Pico della Mirandola and Angelo Poliziano. They enjoyed what Poliziano called the joyful hospitality and placid quietness offered by Lorenzo at the villa. Poliziano wrote poetry here, and scholars such as Pico discussed the philosophy of Plato. So it became a kind of 15th century Florentine equivalent of Plato's Academy or Aristotle's Lyceum, a place where the carefully crafted beauty of nature could elevate both the mind and the spirit. The gardens of the Villa Medici have changed over the centuries. Very subsequent owners made many alterations, but we can still see and feel the imprint of Giovanni's desire to create an enclave of beauty and order through the harmonious interplay of plants and flowers with geometry and architecture. This garden became the template for many of those that followed. For example, for the gardens of the Palazzo Piccolomini in Pienza, constructed for the man who would become Pope Pius II, or the gardens of the Villa di Castello, or the Boboli Gardens south of the Arno in Florence, both designed for the Medici by Niccolo Tribolo. Or indeed, it was the template for many other Italian gardens that we've been blessed with. And so we should thank Giovanni de' Medici for having, in the course of his short, productive life, revived the dream of the ancient Greeks and Romans for a beautiful and well-ordered space in which to enjoy nature and discuss philosophy. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe. Please watch more of my videos. And please, if you want to know more about the Florentines of the 15th century, their gardens, their buildings, their paintings, and their books, please treat yourself to one of my books on the subject, available in your favorite bookstore.